Welcome to Two Messianic Jews, where we think deeply about Messianic Jewish history and theology. Today, we have a special treat for you. Last November, at the world's largest biblical studies conference, a monumental discussion took place between two traditional Jewish scholars, Dr. Kenneth Hansen and Dr. Zev Garber, and two Messianic Jewish scholars, Dr. David Rudolph and Dr. Mark Kinzer. As friends and as scholars, they discussed two primary questions. One, does the New Testament portray Jesus as God? And two, can a divine Messiah fit within Judaism? This event was conducted after the publication of Judaism and Jesus, a book co-written by Dr. Hansen and Dr. Garber, which is a series of essays studying the historical Jesus and whether Messianic Jews should be welcomed into the wider Jewish community. And this is the first book written by traditional Jews inviting Messianic Jews into a good faith conversation. The conversation you will be listening to right now is the fruit of that invitation. Considering these are scholars speaking at an academic conference, they do use some complex language and make some complex arguments. However, their primary points are quite clear. So listen closely and you will certainly learn a lot. Not only that, but these scholars do a great job of demonstrating how we can have a passionate, well-reasoned, and well-meaning discussion on the most crucial of topics with those we strongly disagree with. And you are certainly in for a treat. This conversation will be released in two parts. First, the discussion on whether the New Testament portrays Jesus as God with Dr. Kenneth Hansen and Dr. David Rudolph. Then part two will be Dr. Mark Kinzer and Dr. Zev Garber discussing whether a divine Messiah can fit within Judaism. So subscribe to the channel and the podcast to get notifications so you do not miss part two. Without further ado, here is Dr. Kenneth Hansen. Allow me to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ken Hansen. I'm associate professor at the University of Central Florida, Orlando. I'm also the coordinator of the Judaic Studies program at University of Central Florida, Orlando. Very happy to be here. Want to welcome all our participants this fine afternoon to what I imagine will be a very enlightening and engaging time with, with a very interesting, compelling, important topic. And I'm going to charge ahead and share my own presentation called Koshering Jesus, Christological Conundrums. In the ongoing debate over whether Messianic Jews should be accepted by the larger Jewish community or engaged on in any level, even academically, multiple Christological conundrums present themselves. Reform rabbi and Jewish theologian Dan Kohn Schubach has written, modern Jewish movements embrace a whole range of theological and ideological perspectives. Nonetheless, these disparate branches of modern Judaism are united in their rejection of Messianic Judaism as an authentic expression of the Jewish faith. For Messianic Jews, such a rejection is baffling. Why should they be perceived as the sole inauthentic Jewish movement in contemporary society, given that they believe in God, view Torah as divinely revealed, and remain loyal to Israel? Kohn Sherbach does well to point out that belief in Yeshua as Israel's messianic redeemer is no more radical than the wholesale rejection of God as a supernatural entity, as is common to Reconstructionist and humanistic Judaism. He goes on to argue that including messianic Judaism is the only reasonable starting point for intercommunity relations in the 21st century. His argument is well-reasoned and compelling. Why indeed should Messianic Jews not be welcomed when Jews who have embraced Eastern religions, for example, are by no means escorted to the community egress? Part of the reason may lie in the fact that Jews who have joined another faith tradition generally do not pretend, as it were, that they are still theologically Jewish. A Jewish devotees of a prominent yogi would not be inclined to build an ashram and call it a synagogue, doubtless dubbed Bet Maharishi, present offerings to assorted Hindu deities, or chant Hare Krishna while wearing a talit. The most important reason, however, certainly lies in the theology of Messianic Judaism, which could always accommodate a deeper dive. To be sure, it may be argued that all Jews are Messianic, given that Messianism is, after all, a Jewish concept at its core. Moreover, 
there have been many historical claimants to messianic stature, including the infamous Shimon Bar Kokhba and Shabbatai Tzvi. More recently, assorted radical Chabadniks have so designated the late Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Considering the long and sundry catalog of messiahs scattered across Jewish history, why indeed should a Jew who happens to believe in Yeshua Minatzeret not still be counted as Jewish? The answer to this depends largely on what the word believe means. If an observant Jew believes in the messianism of Jesus in the same way that a member of Chabad might believe that the Rebbe is the anointed one, then it is difficult on the basis of simple logic or Gezerah Shavah to deny such a person's Jewishness. However, if such a version of messianism involves the worship of any human being as divine, then a boundary has certainly been breached, and on a halachic level, it has become an issue of avodah zarah, idolatry. Another question, however, needs to be considered with the help of contemporary Jesus research. If Messianic Jews value inclusion in the larger fabric of Judaism, should they be held captive to classical Christian Trinitarian theology? Should they perhaps undertake to reframe their theological constructs, not needing to jettison Jesus, which I will audaciously argue even strict Orthodox Judaism cannot rightly demand, but to recognize him in a more nuanced Jewish messianic light. On that level, neither the historical Jesus nor his modern devotees have no need of koshering. Yeshua and his original disciples were already quite kosher. Such revelation, however, is not entertained, or reevaluation, I should say, is not entertained by modern Messianic Jewish scholars. While recent scholarship emanating from Messianic Jewish circles is by anyone's estimation impressive, it makes no serious attempt to challenge the theological premises of Protestant Reformed theology. Its main concern is to demonstrate that classical Christology is not inconsistent with Jewish thought and practice. Mark Kinzer, for example, doubles down on the Christian theology of incarnation dressing it up with the term enfleshment. He proceeds to stitch it together with the prophetic idea of the divine presence abiding among the Israelites. There is a certain elegance to the argument, but it has often been said that elegance is best left to one's tailor. It might be countered that this amounts to force-fitting the apostolic fathers into tzitzit and strimmels. No amount of tailoring will do the trick. Even if the garment looks convincing, the wearer, having donned it, is no less foreign to its contours. Whatever the outward comeliness of the fabric, it is not worn well. A better approach, which Kinzer does employ, is to ask whether belief in the manifestation of divinity in any human being might have been considered a kosher fabric among the ancient Jewish populace, and whether Jesus himself or any New Testament writer or redactor might have accepted such clothing. Doubtless, the garment of ancient Judaism was much more variegated than what came to typify the evolving patterns of Jewish thought and practice. It must be viewed in stark contrast with the comparatively uniform tones that characterized the strict orthodoxy of later centuries, including the Tanaitic and Amoraic periods, and of course Maimonides. Ancient Judaism, ancient Judaism was a patchwork of compete, competing sects, each with a radically different approach to Jewish monotheism, and each weaving its own brightly colored threads into the larger tapestry, or as the case may be, Joseph's Ketunet Pasim. Given the radical heterodoxy that typified the multiple Judaisms of the Second Temple period, is it conceivable that long eradicated forms of Messianism embraced a belief that the fullness of the divine presence might actually indwell a human representative on earth? Was there room in the chambered heart of ancient messianism for a conviction that the redeemer who would sit on David's throne would be an avatar for the God of Israel? Might the early Hechalot and Merkava mystical traditions have tolerated such a long expunged view of divine manifestation? If there were indeed room in Second Temple Judaism for such a messianism, it would doubtless be considered an ancient Jewish heresy, though at least something akin to a kosher heresy. 
Moreover, the words attributed to Jesus of Nazareth might be a witness, not to a Trinitarian view of, in, of divine indwelling, but to a different cut of cloth infused with an authentically Jewish color. Is this the garment the historical Jesus would have worn? Is it possible that such an idea held at least by some ancient Jews was not only Jewish in style, but in its deepest fabric? One ancient Jewish text pregnant with such a possibility is Psalm 110, relating to the figure of Melchizedek, who is identified as both a priest of the Most High God and the King of Salem. Might Melchizedek have been imagined as a kind of theophany destined to reappear during the second Jewish commonwealth in messianic garb? Psalm 110.3 is alternately translated, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, NKGV. Thou art a priest forever after the manner of Melchizedek, JPS 1917. You are a priest forever, a rightly king by my decree, JPS 1985. The context of the verse is framed by the Psalms opening. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. The first word translated Lord is the Tetragrammaton. The second Lord is the Hebrew Adoni, meaning my Lord or my master. The plain, simple meaning of my Lord might refer to King David, the traditional author of the Psalm, since the Levites singing the hymn would be referring to the king in the third person. This was suggested by Rashi, Gershonides, and Rabbi David Kimchi. Other Jewish sources suggest that David is singing of Abraham because of the later Melchizedek reference. There have been, not surprisingly, more mystical interpretations. In a commentary on Zechariah's vision of the four craftsmen found in Avot de Rabbi Natan 34.6, it is said that David's Lord is the Messiah of Israel. An additional verse in Zechariah 4.14 describes two anointed ones, likely symbolizing the high priest Aaron and the Davidic Messiah. Some ancient interpreters, returning to Psalm 110.3, believe that a priest of righteousness would be made a priest forever by the words of Melchizedek, who is identical with the Davidic Messiah. Others apparently felt that the psalm reflects God speaking directly to Melchizedek. This is because the words translated according to the order of, after the manner of, or by the words of, that is, al-divrati, may also be rendered by my decree or upon my word. While the standard understanding is that God is addressing David, who is obviously not a priest, the text may be read alternately as follows. You are an eternal priest upon my word, Melchizedek. In short, an evolving Melchizedek backstory seems to have involved a messianic figure who was not only an earthly priest, but who existed from eternity. Psalm 110 is also prominently quoted by Jesus of Nazareth, Luke 20, 41 to 44, who poses a riddle to the scribes interrogating him, asking how the Messiah can be called the son of David when David himself called him Lord. Clearly, Yeshua, Jesus, like many early Israelite sages, understood the psalm messianically. When Yeshua stands trial before the Sanhedrin, he declares, Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God, Luke twenty-two sixty-nine. 69. The power is a euphemism for wisdom, as in Proverbs eight fourteen. I am I am understanding, power is mine. And right hand brings the reader or listener back to Psalm 110. The question posed by the priests, are you then the Son of God, Luke twenty two seventy? is an oblique reference to Psalm 2, 7, variously rendered in Jewish and Christian versions. The Lord said to me, you are my son. I have fathered you this day, JPS 1985. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you, NKGV. However, the Hebrew verb traditionally read as fathered or begotten, yalidaticha, may also be read in feminine form as I have birthed or revealed you, yeladiticha, as a midwife reveals a new baby. 
A link here has also been suggested with the divine voice or bat kol that came from the heavens at Yeshua's baptism. You are my beloved son, in you, in you I am well pleased, Luke 3, 22. The very use of the word son also conjures up Psalm 2, 7 and suggests that Yeshua is being presented in messianic fashion as a newborn is revealed. Moreover, Psalm 2, 7 contains an additional verbal link with Psalm 110.3, traditionally read as follows. From the dawn, yours was the dew of youth, JPS 1985. From the womb of the morning, you have, you have, the, you have the dew of your youth, NKGV. Interestingly, the expression, your youth, yaldutecha, can also be read as in Psalm 2. I have birthed or revealed you. The verse then reads, in do I have birthed or revealed you. Did Yeshua or his followers in the context of Second Temple Judaism evince a conviction consistent with early mystical concepts of the Messiah as a pre-existent being who was David's Lord and who would become incarnate as his son? Did Yeshua go as far as to equate himself with such a personage? Even if, with all bombast, Yeshua did so identify himself, was he claiming divinity along Trinitarian lines? Interestingly, not all Christian denominations think so, and not all worship Jesus as God. The Jehovah's Witnesses are perhaps the best example, honoring Jesus as God's son, but not equating him with God the Father. Melchizedek is also the subject of an important fragmentary text among the Dead Sea Scrolls that centers around the person of this mythologically exalted priest king. Here, Melchizedek appears to be perceived as a judge at the end of days. Your divine being, or Elohim, is Melchizedek, who will deliver them from the power of Belial. 11Q13. When Yeshua repeatedly refers to himself as the son of man, he is most likely conjuring the image of Daniel's son of man presented in a vision and likewise a representation of an eschatological judge. Can, however, divinity be assigned in a Christian Trinitarian formulation to such a figure? By contrast, one can certainly argue that Yeshua would never have done so, even if equating himself with such an exalted judge See Matthew 19, 28. We should, of course, also make mention of the book of Hebrews, which repeatedly equates Yeshua with the figure of Melchizedek. But in the final analysis, even if the writer of Hebrews should be understood as generally consistent with Middle Platonic, Gnostic thought, even if he is guilty, along with John's gospel, of perceiving Yeshua as the divine logos, this is not necessarily the same as viewing him, as later Christian theology would insist, as, the, as of the same essence, or usia, as God. From a contemporary Jewish perspective, the most that can be said of the Melchizedek folklore is that it provides a basis for recognizing an ancient errant notion of an exalted, supernatural, or even supernatural Messiah, not identical with Israel's God, whose stature was deemed to be far beyond the messianic concepts that have come down through traditional rabbinic or Memonidean Judaism. That alone is astounding. For his part, Kinzer is right to point to the multiple examples of the belief among ancient Jews that God has a body, from the ancient anthropomorphisms to the Sephirotic tree. It may be countered, however, that all such imagery amounts to a literary license to express the empathetic nearness of God to Israel. However, if one progresses from philosophic abstraction to sincere faith in the theology of divine incarnation, then one would be hard pressed not to justify the belief that the birth of any human infant might potentially amount to an enfleshment of the God of the universe. Indeed, one might not only justify the worship of Jesus as God, but also the worship of any other human being as divine. Perhaps the worship of Caesar Augustus is mistaken, but it cannot be called pagan. Perhaps the worship of Brooklyn's Rebbe is equally mistaken, but it cannot be called unkosher. It is in fact quite kosher. However, is it not much more logical to assert that the influence of ancient paganism on the Jewish people brought about the infusion of semi-idolatrous thought 
into certain strands of Judaism, especially during the Second Commonwealth. I would argue that such ideas were appropriately deemed treif by subsequent generations of sages through Rambam and beyond. Certainly the identification of Schneerson or anyone else for that matter as the Messiah is understandably troublesome to the bulk of traditional Jews today. But the overt worship of such an individual is understandably unthinkable. And any radical Chabadnik who bows in prayer to the Rebbe as the God of Israel may well expect to be subject to a strict harem. Mistaken ideas have always existed in Judaism, but as the saying goes in contemporary Hebrew, yesh gvul, there is a limit. In any case, we seek to communicate, we seek to engage, we seek to enlighten one another. That spirit must always be cultivated. Thank you very much. All right, Kenan, thank you very much. We're gonna follow the order as printed in the program. And David, I believe you're the second speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm David Rudolph. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Messianic Jewish Studies and professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at the King's University in South Lake, Texas. One of the more surprising developments in the field of Jewish studies over the past 50 years has been a growing interest in the historical Jesus. <clears throat> Contributors to Jewish Jesus research have included Samuel Sandmel, David Flusser, Geza Vermeesh, Amy Jo Levine, Adela Reinhardt, Daniel Boyeran, among many others. In Judaism and Jesus, Zev Garber and Kenneth Hansen build on this burgeoning Jewish scholarship and introduce the reader to the world of Jewish studies in public college and university settings, explaining how Jesus and Judaism can properly intersect in these contexts. An exceptional element of the book is its vision to include Messianic Jewish scholars like Mark Kinzer and me in the conversation. In this paper, I would like to focus on a single issue raised in the book, Jesus's claim to divinity as it relates to the gospels and Messianic Judaism. In his introduction under the section Messianic Judaism, Where I Stand, Garber makes an assertion that is forthright and respectful in tone while setting the stage for the later discussion. As he puts it, let me put this up here. Hence, Yeshua Jesus worshiped as truly God and man is totally unacceptable and incompatible to rabbinic Judaism. I appreciate Garber's bluntness on this matter. There is a halachic boundary marker here. The question remains, however, whether Second Temple Judaism, in contrast to rabbinic Judaism, made more room for a divine Messiah? And if so, should there not be more of an open recognition of this when Jewish scholars weigh in on the historical Jesus and Messianic Judaism? This issue comes to the fore in chapter six of the book, the Shema, the historical Jesus and Messianic Judaism. In the opening paragraph of chapter six, Hansen writes that there is a small cadre of Messianic Jews who have gone further in abandoning Trinitarian concepts altogether. Might that amount to a theological reformation that would cast Messianic Judaism <clears throat> in an entirely new light? A few pages later, he adds, 
if in fact an identity crisis were to blossom into a theological reformation among Messianic Jews, might the movement itself have to be reconsidered as a matter of halakha? While I am sympathetic to Hansen's desire, let me uh, sign. While I am sympathetic to Hansen's desire to bridge the gap between traditional Jews and Messianic Jews, I think his impression of the Messianic movement being open to renouncing Jesus's divinity is wide of the mark. I have been involved in the Messianic Jewish community now for 45 years. My father, who is 81, is a respected rabbi in the movement. And I have visited Messianic synagogues in North America, Israel, Europe, and Asia. In all of these years and in all of these places, I've only met three Messianic Jews who stopped believing in the divinity of Yeshua, but who continue to believe in his Messiahship. Eventually, these three stopped believing that he was the Mashiach altogether and became either Reform or Orthodox Jews. I would say that Messianic Jews who renounce Yeshua's divinity are few and far between. Moreover, there are no mainstream messianic synagogues that deny Jesus's divinity. That said, many Jews who become convinced that Jesus is the son of David only later as part of their journey of studying the New Testament realize that he is a divine Messiah. I am not aware of any theological crisis in our movement over this issue though we are still working out the best way to communicate Jesus's divinity in a way that is informed by traditional Jewish and Christian theologies. The reason for the tendency toward an all or nothing devotion to Yeshua within Messianic Judaism is something that I will explain later in the paper. Hansen also suggests in chapter six that Jesus did not regard himself to be divine. He makes the following comments. It is difficult to imagine how Jesus as an observant Jew would have tolerated the worship of himself. Might the time come when Messianic Jews realize that ascribing worship to Jesus actually does him a disservice. And then, Kant, and then Hansen adds, assuming modern scholarship is correct regarding the true self-awareness and self-conception of Jesus, then if Jesus is worshiped as the enfleshment of God, he is in fact disrespected and the Shema is disregarded. In response to Hansen's remarks, I think it is fair to say that there is a range of New Testament scholarship on the issue of Jesus's self-awareness. For example, in the gospels, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man over 70 times. It is widely held in New Testament studies that in the gospels, son of man functions as a messianic title. And that in many instances, son of man has its antecedent in the exalted figure described in Daniel 7. In his book, The Jewish Gospels, Daniel Boyerin explains how Daniel 7 gave second temple Jews a vision for Israel's divine Messiah. And he writes, in this remarkable text, Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, we find the prophet Daniel having a vision in which there are two divine figures, 
one who is depicted as an old man, an ancient of days, sitting on the throne. We've been told, however, that there is more than one throne there, and sure enough, a second divine figure in form, like a human being, the son of man, to whom will be given eternal dominion of the entire world, of a restored entire world in which this eternal king's guidance and rule will be in accord completely and finally with the will of the ancient of days as well. This, vis this vision, this is the vision that will become in the fullness of time, the story of the father and the son. Boyerin um, maintains that first century Jews longed for the coming of this son of man. And then he adds, Jews at the same time of Jesus had been waiting for a Messiah who was both human and divine and who was the son of man, an idea they derived from the passage from Daniel 7. Versions of this narrative, the son of man's story, the story that is later named Christology, were widespread among Jews before the advent of Jesus. Jesus entered into a, a role that existed prior to his birth. And this is why so many Jews were prepared to accept him as the Christ, as the Messiah, the Son of Man. All four Gospels attest that Jesus identified as the Son of Man. One example is Mark 14, which states, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. Excuse me. Here, Jesus refers to Daniel 7 and reveals that he is the eschatological son of man. Mark and Luke record other statements that Jesus made about his being the son of man who will come in the clouds with power and glory. Returning to Hansen in chapter six, he encourages Messianic Jews to quote, de-center, unquote, Jesus, and to abandon their misplaced belief in his divinity. Hansen appeals to Messianic Jews that the gospel of John is historically unreliable and the synoptics only portray Jesus as a pre-rabbinic sage. But what about Jesus's self-designation as the Daniel 7 son of man who comes on the clouds of heaven? Hansen is silent on these texts and the many others in the gospels in which Jesus reveals his divinity. Hansen suggests that according to serious contemporary research, the historical Jesus did not consider himself divine. However, the only source Hansen cites to support his view is David Flusser's essay, Hillel's Self-Awareness and Jesus. Notably, Flusser writes in another work, The Sign of the Son of Man, that, let me put this up, that Luke 11 has far reaching consequence for the self-awareness of Jesus. One cannot escape the conclusion that in, that in our saying, Luke 11 verses 29 through 32, Jesus identified himself with the eschatological son of man. Hansen gives the impression throughout chapter six that modern scholarship on the historical Jesus uniformly supports his position. But can this be sustained? As Dale Allison points out in his essay, 
the historians Jesus and the church, the attempt to reconstruct the life and teachings of Jesus using criteria of authenticity has yielded no consensus in New Testament studies. He writes, for several decades now, so-called criteria of authenticity, chiefly multiple attestation, dissimilarity, embarrassment, and coherence, have been the tools of choice for most scholars seeking the historical Jesus. But these criteria have not led to any uniformity of result or any more uniformity than would have been the case had we never heard of them. They have brought us the Jesus of the Jesus Seminar, as well as the very different Jesus of John Meyer. This brings us back to what Jesus says about his identity in the extant sources. Jewish scholar Rebecca Lassis provides a helpful synopsis of the Son of Man sayings and their significance in her essay, Supernatural Beings in the Jewish Annotated New Testament. She writes, in the New Testament, Son of Man is Jesus's preferred self-designation, which he also uses cryptically to refer to himself as the eschatological heavenly judge and advocate. For example, in a discussion with skeptical scribes, Jesus states, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, unquote. Jesus thus identifies himself with the Son of Man who has the divine authority to forgive sins. In Mark 14, 61 through 62, the high priest asks him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus answers, I am. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus here quotes from Daniel chapter seven, verse 13, to imply that his future role will be as ruler, seated at the right hand of God. John's gospel uses son of man twice in chapter one, verse 51, and chapter three, verse 13. In sayings of Jesus to refer to the preexistent Christ, for example, chapter 3, verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. In conclusion, Messianic Jews find these texts compelling. We see Jesus portrayed as a divine Messiah, not only in the Gospels, but also in the rest of the apostolic writings. To us, Yeshua's kavod, his glory, so pervades the New Testament that once we see it, it is not possible to deny his divinity as Hansen proposes without cutting out large portions of the New Covenant scriptures. This accounts for the all or nothing devotion to Yeshua as a divine Messiah within Messianic Judaism. In the closing chapter of Judaism and Jesus, Hansen offers an avant-garde vision for collaboration in Jewish Jesus research. He writes, let me put this up. Might Yeshua's Seder table be conceived as a meeting place for scholars of diverse religious and academic persuasion to collaborate on serious and productive research into ancient Judaism's many currents and should not all be accepted at the table, even Messianic Jews. Judaism and Jesus is the first book by traditional Jews that calls for the inclusion of Messianic Jews in Jewish Jesus research. I applaud Zev Garber 
and Kenneth Hansen for not just talking about this, but also having the chutzpah to invite Mark Kinzer and me to be part of this conversation. My hope is that through these papers, Zev, Ken, Mark, and I will learn from each other, even when we strongly disagree. I also hope that we will grow in sovlanut, tolerance, and hakarat hatov, gratitude, through studying together. As Rabbi Yochanan said, after the death of his study partner, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, with whom he sparred regularly. With Reish Lakish, whenever I would say something, he would pose 24 difficulties. And as a result, the subject became clear. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin comments on this text and says, serious challenges, as long as they are not just offered to be provocative, should be treated with respect since they deepen understanding and lead to a fuller appreciation of truth. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you learned something new, please consider liking and subscribing to receive updates for when part two is posted. Please let us know where you agree, disagree, or share any questions you have in the comments below. Or you can send us an email at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. That's T-W-O messianicjews at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you and see you next time.